The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. As we all know, the price of gas is skyrocketing. It's a big issue for the President of the United States, namely because he's under fire to address inflation. Part of his response to soaring fuel prices was to lift a ban on the sale of E15 fuel. E15 stands for 15% ethanol, and adding it saves gas, it also then saves money, and in doing so, it also reduces carbon output. A welcome announcement, you'd think, asked Mark Rausch, the executive VP of the Auto Channel. Well, it should be, he answers his own question, but it wasn't. Ethanol, says Rausch, is the forgotten alternative fuel. The only one that blends with current gasoline while improving air quality and saving money. So, if ethanol is the magic bullet in the fuel sector, why is it so maligned? Well, Rausch says it's historical, and the reasons are hysterical. Namely, he claims it comes down to the power and influence of the Rockefeller family. To take us on a fascinating examination of the history of ethanol, I invited Mark Rausch to join me for a conversation that matters about the remarkable advantages to a fuel supplement you, that you can only buy at four gas stations in all of Canada and sparsely throughout the United States. Mark, welcome. Hi, Steve. Great to be back with you again. You know, we, we really, as a general population, don't have much of a relationship with ethanol. What exactly is it? How is it made? And what is it made from? Well, ethanol is drinking alcohol. Uh, it's different than isopropyl, which is uh, basically rubbing alcohol or wood alcohol or the methanol. Those are all, everything that ends sort of with the alls, you know, methanol, ethanol, all that. Those are all alcohols. They're made differently and only one kind of alcohol is drinkable and that's ethanol. And just as you would think, it's made from different types of grains. So it could be wheat, barley, could be made from potatoes. Anything you would make drinking alcohol from is, can be made into ethanol fuel that you would use in, a, in an engine. It just has to be a high enough percentage so that um, it doesn't have too much water or, or other ingredients in it. But it's just drinking alcohol. Can you make your own? Yes, and that's one of the best things about it. it it's, a, it's a control device, if you will. Where, I mean control, I don't mean to say you're in control, but it, it stops people from being, other people being in control. Because anyone could make their own ethanol fuel. And in the United States, you could get a permit where you can make up to 10,000 gallons of ethanol a year doesn't cost anything uh, so if you have a still you can get this permit and that's if you if you distilled it to be a high enough alcohol percentage that would pretty much take you through uh, most of the year in terms of your fuel needs if if that's what you wanted to do with it uh, so but anyone could do it and and therefore no one could really say well that's it we're stopping production we're stopping distribution of it because people, my neighbors, my, me and my neighbors could get together and we could have a still and we could make our own fuel and, and therefore we'd be okay. In fact, a couple of years ago when I went to Australia, I started my speech off. I was doing a speech for, about ethanol um, and I started it off with a clip from Mad Max, the movie with uh, Mel Gibson. And I said, if if the people at that time in the future understood that they could make their own ethanol for fuel, then Max and all these bad guys running around, you know, with all the crazy outfits and stuff, they wouldn't have had to, to get crazy about the only remaining gasoline. They would have all just made their own ethanol and they could have powered all their vehicles and would have been a much safer time. <laughs> 
<laughs> in that movie. But I guess it wouldn't have been as good a movie. <laughs> so, so when I bring up the topic of ethanol who, with people who are uh, well informed, they can't help but go, oh, well, hang on a second. Uh, are you not taking from the food supply then to make fuel for a car? Because we hear that repeatedly. Is there a risk here that we're going to uh, take food out of the food supply chain just so that we can run automobiles, internal combustion automobiles? It, the corn that's grown for ethanol fuel is primarily not consumable by humans. It's not suitable for humans to eat. It can be eaten by animals. And in fact, when they make ethanol, the exact same corn, the same kernels that go to the making of the mash that gets then distilled into the ethanol fuel, that those remnants are then fed to the animals, cattle, cows, right? uh, uh, pigs, chicken, things like that. And, and those are animals that we do eat. And that is full of protein. So it's actually the best part for them. If they eat, if animals eat corn, uh, corn on the cob, they're eating the starch. The starch doesn't do anything for them. It doesn't do anything for the people who, who raise cattle for food. What they want is the protein. So they're getting in the distilled, in the dried distillers grains, they're getting this great protein fit food to feed the animals. So we're actually getting more food and more fuel at the same time. So it doesn't take anything out of the mix. I got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Hmm. So what happened? How come then if it is such a uh, wonderful source of fuel, why does the automobile industry uh, malign it or discount it? Well, a large part of the automobile industry historically or hysterically <laughs> doesn't malign it and hasn't maligned it. For example, Henry Ford knew that alcohol ethanol was great. The, the primary scientists at General Motors who were then responsible for creating, for inventing leaded gasoline, they knew that ethanol fuel was the fuel of the future. Harry Ricardo, uh, a very famous British engine designer and builder, uh, knew that alcohol was the best. So, so people knew it. People in, this, in the industry knew it. What happened was that General Motors scientists, in experimenting with different ways to increase the oxygenate, uh, increase the octane of uh, gasoline, they tried different things. They knew ethanol was great, but for fun, they were trying different things. Not for fun, for business. And one of the things that they used was tetraethyl lead. And that allowed their, that allowed the gasoline to mitigate the engine knock that was occurring if you didn't have any additive, if you didn't have ethanol, for example, in the fuel. Uh, higher compression engines required this. So they looked at, they did this, they saw that, okay, well, this could work. And what happened was that somebody at General Motors said, well, you know, we could patent this. And if we patent this, we can make uh, billions of dollars. And so that rang a whole bunch of bells. Now, they couldn't do the same with ethanol because ethanol has, has been in the public domain for 2,000 years, 3,000 years, whatever the time is. Uh, there, there is no secret to making ethanol. So they couldn't do that, but they could do it with leaded gasoline, with tetraethyl lead. And so that's the direction that they went in. And in doing so, now, General Motors then partnered with Standard Oil. General Motors at the time was the largest automotive company in the world. They partnered with the largest oil company in the world, Standard Oil, which is 
was primarily owned by the Rockefeller family, and they partnered with DuPont Chemical. And so there were three of them. Now, the interesting thing about DuPont is that the DuPont family owned a majority or certainly the controlling interest. They, they owned an enormous part of the stock of General Motors. And Pierre DuPont, who was the leader of the family, he was the president of General Motors. So they stood to gain twice in the equation, in the three in the three part partnership, they had two parts, right? Because DuPont, General Motors, they controlled both. And then you had Standard Oil. But so they controlled the two things. So to them, that was the smart thing to do. They didn't own farms, they didn't own any distilleries. That wasn't their business. So they went off to do leaded gasoline. Now in England and in Europe, they were using ethanol as an additive, uh, both to extend their supply of gasoline, number one, and also that as these higher compression engines were being developed in, in England, Europe, rest of Europe, they were using ethanol as the knock mitigator to um, to run on the higher compression engines. They didn't like, they Europe knew of the dangers of lead. They've known about it for 2000 years. So they were concerned about using leaded gasoline. They didn't want to use it. Standard Oil, the largest oil company in the world, um, and, and one of their baby companies, which at the time was called Esso, we know of them today as Exxon, um, they still wanted to sell fuel in England and in the rest, rest of the world. So they created something that they called power alcohol. And power alcohol was ethanol gasoline blends. And that's what they sold from the 1920s, late 1920s until into the 1970s. And they always marketed it as being cleaner, safer, more powerful, and more economical than any other gasolines. And for some strange reason, very few people made the connection that what they're doing in England, they could be doing here. This is our second break. We'll be back in a moment. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. How much cleaner is ethanol than gasoline when it burns? Well, the best way to really talk about that is to say, if you look at some videos, which are online and they're on the auto channel, we have them, you look to see gasoline without ethanol burning, and then you look to see what ethanol burning looks like. And they ha we have them side by side. The gasoline produces black smoke. Right? If you have anything over it to capture the black smoke, like a, a white um, napkin, it'll get completely black, right? That is what develops, that goes into the air and it develops in the fuel system. If you look at the ethanol, it's clean. It doesn't look like anything, you know, didn't look, doesn't look like anything uh, emitted. Now, when you combine the two of them together, as we do now with, with blends like E10, E20, E15, E85, so there is a mix because you have gasoline and you have ethanol. So the gasoline, of course, produces the debris, the the um, the black smoke, and all the rest of that. And but the ethanol doesn't contribute. So now to directly answer the question and say, so how much cleaner would E15 be, or E85, or E25 be compared to? E0, which is ethanol without, uh, gasoline without any ethanol. It could be, depending on the blend, it could be 40% cleaner, 50% cleaner, 60% cleaner. So it, it really depends. And if, if you get to a point where you would say, oh, well, it's really not clean enough. We want it to be cleaner. Well, then it means you should up the blend. So don't use E20. Don't use E15. Don't use E10. Use E30, use E40, yeah. use E50. 
So, is there still not a carbon uh, uh, element that is released on the burning of ethanol? Uh, because you are using a carbon-based material to begin with. When you burn it, are you not also still releasing carbon into the atmosphere? Yeah. Uh, yes. But what you're not releasing are, are, the, um, are the particulate matter that is what co can cause most of the problems, for example, in people's lungs. It's, it's not releasing into the atmosphere the burnt, any of the burnt debris, the black smoke. And there is no benzene, toluene, or xylene in ethanol. And so you're not releasing those things into the air. And you can't make gasoline without it containing what's called the aromatics, which are the benzene, the toluene, and the xylene. And those are highly poisonous. A study, I think I mentioned this to you a couple of years ago when I was on the show last time, uh, a study done in the late 40s by the um, American Petroleum Institute, which is the, the leading mouthpiece organization for the gasoline and for the oil industry. They did a study in the late 40s that said there is no amount of benzene that is safe to go into the atmosphere, safe to humans. But you can't make gasoline without having benzene in it. Well, I would also point out that the difference would be that if you're produce if you're generating carbon from what had been a plant-based material to begin with, you're not pulling carbon that had been sequestered in the earth and putting it back, and putting it into the atmosphere. You're actually part of a biogas loop, which is the uh, carbon comes down as absorbed by plants. It was already in the atmosphere and you're just cycling it back. So it's a completely different e equation. Third and final break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Uh, what about performance? Am I going to see a loss of performance and will I see a loss of uh, mileage uh, per gallon? The ethanol, at a, at a, if you take a gasoline engine, st standard non-flex fuel car, and you put E10 in it, the E10 will probably get slightly less mileage than if you were using E0 gasoline. And that's because the engine is optimized to run on the gasoline. Now, if you use the E10 or E15 or anything higher, there's a big difference in price. So the difference can be big. And that difference usually makes up for the loss of mileage. So typically, you would still come away with saying that in using the ethanol blend, I have a net gain from doing it. Now, the interesting thing is, is that as you actually will add ethanol to the blend so that you get to the point of E30, E40, E50, you actually will get as good or better mileage, even though it has more ethanol than E10. And so therefore you would think, well, it should get worse mileage. It doesn't, it gets best mile, it gets better mileage, the best mileage. Uh, will it have an impact on warranty? Okay, uh, yes, it will, because the company, the manufacturers say, oh, you shouldn't use anything higher than this. If that's of concern to you, then you shouldn't do it. Right, and people shouldn't do it. And I never say to people, uh, just go and do it, and and don't worry about the warranty. I say, it's a warranty, and and you have it, you use it. But you know, warranties run out, right? You get to a point of three years or five years, or in the case of Kia and Hyundai, and you have a ten year warranty, and you get to the point and you're, uh, you no longer have a warranty, then do whatever you want to do. But here's the important thing. The exact same vehicles that we have here in America and in Canada are sold in Brazil and they are in Brazil and they have the same structure of new cars, newer cars, old cars, very old cars that we have, right? Same thing. The minimum 
fuel, the minimum, uh, the mandated ethanol, minimum ethanol mandate in Brazil is E27, 27%. They have the exact same cars. They have no issues. If Ford sells a car down there, they warranty that car for E27. And they say the same thing. If it's a non, in Brazil, they use a different technology, a different terminology. They don't say flex fuel, they call it total flex. So if it's not a total flex car, it's just a standard non-flex car, they say to you, don't use anything over E27, <laughs> but you can use up to E27, but it's the exact same car that's here. And that's true with all General okay. Motors product, project, yeah. products, all the yeah. Asian so, <laughs> so, so final question here, Mark, because I'm already over time. I'm going to have to trim this back in, um, in post. <laughs> Okay, I pointed out that there's only four gas stations in all of Canada, and it's not readily or easily available in the United States. Let's say somebody's watching this and they go, okay, I'm not going to make my own ethanol. What are their options if they can't get it at a service station? Well, um, you have to ask for it, you have to demand it, and you have to look for, for one. We, we actually have a lot of, you know, all gasoline in America now uh, basically is E10. Uh, you really have to go out of your way to, to buy E0. So you have E10. In many cases, you have E85. Not every station is E85, but for example, in my city in Sacramento, we have, oh, I don't know, seven, eight, nine stations. And um, so what's the name of your book, Mark? The Ethanol Papers, of course. <laughs> And where can it where can it be purchased? Well, here's the good part: you could buy it, and if you want to buy it, thank you. You could buy it on Amazon, uh, or on Barnes and Noble, and they'll send it to you. But here's the here's the good part: it's available to read completely for free online on the Auto Channel. You don't have to pay anything. You don't even have to register your name. I did it that way purposely because the goal was to get the information out there. Thank you, Mark. You are an encyclopedia about ethanol. I want to have you come back. We're going to talk electric cars in the future. Thank you.